Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to get started with our next panel talking about blockchain security. So that's a very big issue. Uh, if we're building this new infrastructure for a new, you know, a new internet of, of uh, decentralized value transfer, how are we going to make sure that it's secure and that your value can be properly transferred? Um, for this panel, I'd like to welcome our moderator, Taj Drizia, the one of the um, the, the developer of the Lightning Network and a researcher at the Digital Currency Initiative, uh, Professor Sharon Goldberg from Commonwealth Crypto, Jeremy Rubin, who's founded this expo four years ago, and he's joining us again today, and, Char and Charles Guillaume from uh, Ledger. So everyone give him a round of applause. So as a reminder, you have until 1 p.m. And at 1 p.m., say a lot however much time you want for uh, question and answers. And you don't have to stop speaking at 1, but I will hold up the applause. So <laughs> if you can talk over them, then go for it. <laughs> Take it away. OK. Hi, everyone. Um, so we've got a panel about security. And I thought I'd start off with a question. And this is a, you know interactive thing. You can raise your hands. Uh, who here has lost coins? So, yep, yep. so quite a number of people. Is it you know exchange hacks, losing a private key, local machine compromise, losing a paper wallet? So okay, decent number of people have lost coins. Um, so in this talk about security, it's like well maybe we don't actually have that great security, right? There's there's a lot of work left to be done. Uh, a lot of people have lost coins, have lost money, which is sort of the whole thing that this system is pro supposed to prevent. Uh, whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, any coin, like. You're supposed to get, be able to keep them. Um, so clearly, we've got a lot of work left to do. Um, and so the first question we're going to go with is, how do, we, uh, how do you improve these things? Uh, how do you fix things once things have gone wrong? And so uh, I guess we can start. Uh, Professor Goldberg, what, what do you think is the best way to fix things once they've gone wrong? So I, I actually want to say something that's really interesting and just take a step back on this issue. So if we think about other cryptographic sy systems, one of the most important things in cryptographic systems that involve keys is having ways to revoke keys when they get compromised. And what's kind of interesting about blockchain is it was sort of just doesn't have a way to do that. And so, you know, when we talk about like a public key infrastructure system for, you know, TLS for secure connections, if your um, if your key is compromised on the certificate, you'll just issue a new certificate, revoke the old one, and everything's fine, right? If this happens with your Bitcoin key, then you've just lost your bitcoins. So, you know, I think that. As a security person, kind of like designing this whole system and not having a revocation mechanism in it, um, on one hand, it's just it's kind of crazy. On the other hand, like we have these amazing technologies and we just don't have a way to do revocation. That's how we get this amazing technology. We had to give up on revocation. And so that's forced us to kind of come up with other ways to solve this problem. Um, I think actually I'd rather start at that side of the table okay, yeah. because these guys are, that's what their entire focus on is at Ledger. But I think just sort of stepping back from blockchain versus other cryptographic systems, it is really interesting that we just sort of punted on revocation. We're like, we'll solve it some other way. So It's the don't screw up model where if you lose your coins, well, you know, it's over. There's no recovery. Yeah. Uh, yeah, completely agree. The, the main point of security in blockchain application is the private key. So that's why at Ledger we, we try to, to ease the storage and the use of the private key. Uh, you probably know our uh, star product, which is the Ledger Nano S. Uh, in, in this case, we put all the security of the system in a single point, a uh, secure element, because uh, in most industries, when the security was a big challenge, the, the industry decided to put all the security in a single point, in, in a secure enclave, uh, a secure element. So that, that's what, that was the choice for the security that uh, we did at Ledger. So when the user wants to use its Bitcoins, he, or he only has, has to use uh, uh, his, his Ledger Nano S and the security is provided by the secure element inside the Nano S. So the Nano S um, is able to store securely the key and when the user wants to use its, its coins, um, 
the secure element provides a high level of security? Uh, yeah, so I think uh, one of the challenges in this space is actually understanding, uh, and I don't think this answers Taj's question quite, which is how do we fix bugs, but... Um, we Under it's more general. Yeah. yeah, just everyone kind of needs to understand what exactly their threat model is and what things they think they're likely to encounter um, and what preventative measures they should take in order to address that. Um, so to go on uh, what Sharon talked about with... Uh, like, oh, we can't do key revocation. Actually, if you could do key revocation, that would undermine one of the critical properties of Bitcoin, which is that, hey, you can't revoke a key, so once you've, once you've authorized a transaction, you can't undo it in a reorg. Um, it could be reapplied um, by you know, a miner that's not colluding with the user trying to redo that transaction. Um, in general, I think Ledger is a fantastic product that uh, if you trust the underlying you know, guarantees of what Bitcoin is doing, gives you fantastic security. Um, but I think that not enough people understand what exactly they are getting out of Bitcoin other than, oh, I can like, maintain and hold this coin. Um, but they don't know what it entirely entails you to, to actually have that coin. Yeah, having so a key is not necessarily having a coin. It's having a way to signify that you own that coin. So and that's another question. Sort of, before you can even start to improve these systems, and you know, you could say, okay, we're we're in like whack-a-mole mode where all these bugs happen, people lose money, Mt. Gox gets hacked, and we're like trying to apply fixes. We might need to back up and say, okay, what are our threat models? What are the things we're trying to make this system do? Um, and a lot of times, it's not clear that people have actually defined this. So you could maybe share, share and you could say like, yeah, a lot of places you're saying don't have that those kinds of definitions. So and, in terms of threat models, I think another really interesting thing about how this whole space started, you know, with the original Satoshi paper, um, my former postdoc, Fotini Baltimsi, she, every time she gives a talk about um, e-currency or uh, e-cash or blockchain, the first thing she'll say is, we don't even understand the security guarantees of these systems. So from a, the perspective of theoretical cryptographies, we're still really, really just sort of trying to even understand what the security guarantees are. But, you know, the standard that she would apply to this understanding is much, much higher than what, you know, the rest of us may apply. But, you know, that, that piece of the understanding is still missing. Um, and the other thing is that in terms of threat models, I, I agree with Jeremy that the community is a bit leaving these behind. Um, so, you know, sometimes we sit down and read a white paper for a new project and we're trying to understand like what are the security properties of it and we'll find a footnote of like some oracle in there that has to be trusted in order for the system to be secure. So, you know, like the, the level of, you know, what you're even trusting in the system is often not at all clear and I think it would be, you know, very helpful if that standard of threat modeling at, at the beginning of, you know, this is my project, this is the threat model, this is what we expect to happen, these are the risks. Um, that needs to start to happen a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I agree that it's so coming from like doing VC stuff, when you're like t pitching to a VC, they don't want to hear about the problems. But from like an engineering perspective, it's like, here's all the ways it can break, right? Here's all the things that can go wrong, and we've identified them. And it's like not necessarily what people want to hear about when they're like really excited about a new technology. But <laughs> and I think part of it is maybe even the term threat model is problematic for people. They kind of feel embarrassed to say, hey, we have a threat model and these things are outside of it. Um, perhaps it'd be better if we just talked about, hey, here are our security trade-offs. Yes, we have a trusted Oracle, but we are trusting them insofar as, hey, they don't know what contracts they're actually signing things for. So they sign something, but like they have no maybe ability unless they're colluding, versus a system where uh, you, know, you would see all the contracts and then you get to decide which way they all execute. So I think that it's just the trade-off that you choose to make. Um, and presenting that front and center is actually going to be healthy for the ecosystem, and it shouldn't be something I think that people try and hide in a footnote. Yeah. Yeah. Any threat model? Our threat model is, is quite simple. We, 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 our assumptions are very simple. For us, our customers are in an interested environment, completely interested environment. Uh, their their computers are probably compromised. Um, the, so in this environment, we want the, uh, our customer to, to, to be able to use securely uh, their, uh, their crypto assets. Uh, another uh, threat model is uh, the attacker can go 
in your house, still your, your Nano and your, your coin are still safe. So threat model is uh, physically your, your, your coin are, are safe even if the, the attacker um, steal your Nano. And when you use your assets, again, you, you can use them in, even in a completely uh, compromised environment. Okay, cool. So, yeah, with threat models and like improving things, one thing to look at is responsible disclosure. So, I've got some, I think a bunch of us have experience with those kinds of things where there's these systems out there. Uh, people find bugs, people find vulnerabilities, people find things that are wrong. And, you know, you, you're not necessarily under any obligation to say this. A lot of times you can just be like, whatever. Um, but there are processes you can go through for like responsible disclosure. Uh, if anyone, I mean, I know. Uh, Jeremy, you've done stuff. Uh, Sharon, you've, you've, there's a recent uh, one that you published that was really interesting. Does that, you know, if you guys want to talk about that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, so before, let's just define responsible disclosure. Um, so when we, as security researchers, find vulnerabilities, we sort of ethically are expected to disclose this in a way that causes minimum damage to the public that's relying on whatever system that has been found to be vulnerable. So responsible disclosure means we go to the party that maintains or implements the system and we say, you have this bug, you need to fix it, you have this much time, after this much time I'm going public with the vulnerability. And the reason you give that, um, that deadline is so that they don't kind of drag their feet and like tell you, oh, next week, next week, next week, and like two years go by and it's still not patched. So, there's typically like a period after which you're going to do the disclosure, and before that, you keep it quiet and you give them time to patch. So that's what responsible disclosure means. Um, by contrast, full disclosure means I found a vulnerability, I post my paper online, I tell the newspaper, and then too bad for everyone, right? Because we need this needs to be fixed now, and I don't want to take the time to to, dis to disclose this to the party that could fix it ahead of time. So full disclosure is sometimes used in cases where you really don't think that the party that's supposed to fix the problem would actually do it. So you're just like doing it, full disclosure, I don't believe you're ever gonna fix this. There you go, bugs out, now just scramble to deal with this problem. So most of us security researchers, we try to do responsible disclosure whenever possible. Um, in, the, in the space that we're in right now, um, it's really interesting because this, uh, vulnerabilities we find directly translate to money, and so there's more risk associated. So for instance, if I find a security vulnerability that allows me to steal a whole bunch of Bitcoin, um, I obviously shouldn't uh, carry out that attack, right? That wouldn't be ethical as a security researcher. But um, there was one really famous, um, who's heard of the selfish mining attack on Bitcoin? Yeah, so that was actually done by full disclosure, right, Ethan, yes? Was it full disclosure? I'm not sure, okay. I think, I'm pretty sure that that what didn't have a long period of, um, of disclosure um, where Bitcoin was able to fix the problem. And so for, for, for that, well, that was one of the early sort of vulnerabilities found in a blockchain system. I think it was 2015 or 14? 14. 14. So, um, so that was really interesting because the authors of that paper said that the difficulty in disclosing this, this vulnerability was that it was a mining attack and the developers of, um, the Bitcoin core developers were also involved potentially in mining. And so if we disclose this to the Bitcoin core developers, then maybe they might go off and use their mining hardware to use this attack and like make more money. And so they would behave unethically because they knew ahead of time about the vulnerability and they would exploit it for their own gain. Um, and so that creates a challenge for disclosure when you have the parties that are maintaining the system to also be the parties that are like making a lot of money off the system. So there's this inherently difficult challenge with these distributed systems that use distributed governance that have lots of different people involved, that have all sorts of motivations. Some of them are working for big companies, some of them are miners. You don't exactly know who these people are that are contributing to these projects and then you reveal a vulnerability to them and you have to hope that everyone kind of behaves ethically. So that's the, that's the world that we're living in um, and that's what makes it hard. I mean, personally, we've had two disclosures. Um, we did one um, with Bitcoin eclipse attacks in 2015 and we did one with Ethereum eclipse attacks in 2018. In both cases, it was very pleasant, actually. So we didn't run into any trouble. 
Um, with the Bitcoin one, it was still early days, so we just emailed people we knew and we told them about it, and they immediately started patching. We had a lot of patches, so they, like we had you know like six patches, um, but they immediately put in three patches like within two months of our disclosure. So that was really um, you know that was really easy. And then the Ethereum one, similarly, you know we gave them two months and they had patched it before we had uh, before our deadline. So in both of those cases. Um, it was easy. There, there was a, a vulnerability disclosure program for Ethereum in 2018. There is actually like a proper way to do this, and there's like a person who's responsible for this, who we like contacted on Signal and like told us to talk to this developer, and then we worked with that specific developer and fixed it. So it was very simple and clean. But um, I know that there may be other people who've had experiences that weren't quite so simple. Yeah. I mean, should I talk? So I guess I can talk about my we. Uh, well, and Ethan, you know, a couple people uh, looked at IOTA, um, which was an interesting, I don't know what it is. Uh, and, and <laughs> Who here owns IOTA coin? <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember looking at it, because they wanted to give a talk at MIT. And I was like, nah. And, and, I, and I was like, nah, it's probably some scam. And then they got mad at me. They're like, Tad, you say everything's a scam. And I'm like, okay, that's true, I do. Uh, I should at least look at it before calling it a scam. And so I did, and I was like, this is really weird. And then I had lunch with Ethan that day. And I was like, hey, have you seen IOTA? They like wrote their own hash function. And Ethan's like, dude, you ruined my weekend. I need to break this thing. Uh, so then we, you know, we, we did, uh, and we mailed them. And it, was, it just got weirder and weirder, where like, they just start sort of denying all like, terms and conditions. We're like, this is not a signature. We've sort of redefined what signature means. And we've redefined what like a hash function is because collisions are okay because it was supposed to have collisions. And you're like, what, what are they doing? Oh, anyway, this is like broken, right? Can you fix it? Are you guys going to fix it? Um, and, and they did, right? So, so we did the, to some extent, a fairly messy but responsible disclosure at least. And, you know, they changed their hash function. They updated their software and then we went public and then they sort of started attacking us and saying how we're, we're committing fraud by claiming things that aren't true. I don't know. Uh, so it was, it was kind of a big mess. And I think it has discouraged uh, other researchers from doing responsible disclosure with that team. Uh, because there, were, there later have been two or three other, like the whole system's kind of crazy. Um, and other people have said like, hey, here's this replay attack. Or here's this, you know, if you sign the number 13, it reveals your private key, which actually was released like a week or two ago. And they didn't bother with just responsible disclosure. They're just like, we're just doing full disclosure. They doesn't seem like... Uh, there's a lot of, you know, it, it was just sort of hostile, and and it, you know, it doesn't give people a good feeling to do it. Whereas I think with the Ethereum team, it was like, oh, people are cool. People are like, hey, thanks for finding this bug and helping us fix it. Um, so, yeah, do you have other? Yeah, I think what's interesting is that going off of uh, Sharon's definition of what responsible disclosure is, at a high order, you're doing the thing that you think minimizes harm to the public. It's not the thing that minimizes harm to the company or to the people working on the project or even to the coin holders. It's like, okay, well, if I'm looking at a coin and I think it's like, you know, insanely insecure and it is worth $1 billion now and the trend says it's going to be worth $3 billion, you know, in a week, um, that's another $2 billion of dollars going into a system that like may or may not be reparable. If you think that it's not going to be repaired, then full disclosure is actually probably the responsible disclosure in that case, even though it is you know, considered less uh, tactful. You're supposed to give people like, a little bit of grace. I think it depends on uh, you know, really heavily the community. I think we're you know, maybe going to see a lot more of these things just being, hey, you know, I'm just going to drop it because it should be repaired as quickly as possible. There's also another incentive, I think, when you are a holder of a coin, and if you discover a vulnerability, you really should estimate how long it's going to take for somebody else to discover that vulnerability. And if you actually are a holder of that coin, you might say, okay, I think this is going to like, reduce the you know, worth of my coins by a significant amount if it's not fixed as soon as possible. I'm just going to release patch software and you know, like, information about this as quickly as possible to fix it, um, irrespective of if you think you, know, you should tell other people. Um, so I think that it's going to get, you know, probably more complicated um, as we go on on like what the best practices are in this space because it's not going to look the same as best practices for like a web application. Yeah, there's a lot of incentive things. How about Ledger? 
As a security provider, uh, I completely agree with uh, what, what have been said. I'm completely for the responsible disclosure and completely against the full disclosure because, because the, we want to protect our users. So uh, full disclosure means that the, the researcher gives the opportunity to all the attackers to, to, to get the coins from, from our users. So it's, it's a clearly a, a bad thing for us and for our users, of course. And so we, we have a bounty program. You can have a look uh, on our website. So if ever a researcher uh, finds a vulnerability on uh, our, our product, um, he, he is encouraged to, to follow a responsible disclosure, meaning that, uh, first of all, we discuss with the researcher. We try to understand what you find, uh, what you found, and so on. Uh, and then we try to, to figure out how to patch it. And because we have a versatile system uh, with a root, root of trust, we are able to upgrade uh, all the, um, the device on the field. And so that when the device are upgraded, uh, we disclose the vulnerability. Uh, and then the researcher is also able to publish on his vulnerability because we want to be completely trans transparent uh, security-wise. And um, in order to promote this, also we, uh, we give incentive to, to the researcher, meaning we reward them, uh, giving, giving them some bitcoins uh, according to the value of uh, the, the, their findings. Uh, also, I, I take the, this, opportunity, this opportunity to um, to talk about our capture the flag. Uh, we're la launching a capture the flag uh, uh, with several um, several steps, uh, and the last step is a dedicated hardware bounty on which there is uh, more than one bitcoin. And uh, uh, if uh, if someone is able to break it, the, the bitcoin is for him. I just wanted to add a couple of things. So for people who are like just thinking about getting into this stuff, I also teach a class where we do, we actually audit websites. So it's a much simpler sort of security disclosure setting. But um, if you do decide to get into this stuff, some uh, things to look for if you want to consider whether you're going to have an easy time or a hard time with your disclosure. So, um, you know, it's just projects that have bug bounties, you like those better. You know, you're going to have an easier time because you'll actually, there'll be a person that, whose job it is to talk to you, so that's one thing. And, you know, they promise to give you something in order, in return for you finding the bug, which probably means they are less likely to, like, sue you or drag your name through the mud, so these are good things. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say was that I think that as a community, I think we need to start to have standards for disclosure and sort of have ways to signal to the less tech savvy investors that are investing into all these altcoins, like who are the blockchains that are dealing with security vulnerabilities in a responsible way? You know, so uh, we have in the traditional world, we have CERT, which, which takes disclosures and um, you know, we have disclosure numbers, we have vulnerability numbers, like we have CVE numbers. I think it would be, you know, I think what we need to be having for the blockchain world is CVE numbers for blockchain vulnerabilities. We need to have some sort of point where, you know, the CVE is listed and if you've got a CVE listed for a blockchain, and it's just a collect, like a central point people can see, you know, this blockchain has had like 700 CVEs, they weren't patched. I mean, that should signal to the less technical community that like maybe this project isn't very secure and very responsible. So I think that that's um, unfortunately like uh, some of the some of the disclosure discussions are like geeks talking to geeks and so people who are outside of like the geek world don't really understand like who's who's uh, you know who's right. Um, so if you're if you're if you're a security researcher you can look at these conversations you could say like clearly you know the security researcher's right or the security researcher's wrong like you'll have a judgment but we're you know it's not just us anymore you know there's the wider world playing in this space now and so I think it would be nice as a community if we could signal to the outside world like we have an established body that understands vulnerabilities. Yes, this is a real vulnerability. It was not patched, you know. So, so that would be something that even an un, an untech person can understand, and he won't have to read blog posts and read Twitter fights and silliness, right? So, I think that would just be helpful for the community in general, and we would probably end up with more secure projects as a result. Yeah. Um, those kinds of disclosures, actually, it's kind of interesting in blockchain, at least I, from my experience with Bitcoin. Um, it's, it actually gets really complicated because let's say, 
Oh, oftentimes it's the people working on the code itself who find vulnerabilities. Like, oh, found a bug. This could have some kind of attack. Um, let's fix it. Let's fix it in a way that's not um, super obvious. Like you put it in a git commit with some other things and it's like not as super obvious so people, because it's all open source. Um, another complication because, comes because there's so many coins that grab code from each other. So if someone finds a vulnerability in Bitcoin, calls some Bitcoin core developers and says, hey, here's some attack. Uh, well, what about Litecoin and Dogecoin and all these other coins that, you know, basically take all the Bitcoin core code base? Um, do you have to wait for them to get patched as well before you can, you know, publicly disclose it? Um, and so there's these weird cascading effects also that make it pretty complicated. Um, and there have been a bunch of parts where, you know, things get disclosed for one and not the other. Um, so that, that makes it actually quite a bit more involved than, you know, the traditional, like, a founder bug on your website or something like that. Yeah, I think there's also sometimes a case for uh, like fixing without disclosing. Uh, so where you discover a bug, you don't tell anyone about it. You're writing software. You know, this has happened to me where I'm like writing code, and I'm like, hey, you know, this thing doesn't quite work like I thought it should work. Um, and I'm like, oh, this is actually a vulnerability. Um, and then I, you know, report it to the you know correct channels, and they're like, okay, uh, that is a vulnerability. There's something that bad could, that could happen. Uh, and then it's like difficult to fix without the code that I was writing anyways. And so I remove it from the code I was writing, which makes it like lower quality. And then that sits and like, you know, doesn't move along. And then it's like, okay, well, the reason why it's not moving along is because like, this is like a broader class of vulnerabilities that could be fixed with like something a bit higher level. And then I write the code starting to do that, but it's like you can't disclose like, hey, this is actually kind of urgent to move forward on this in order to like address like a bigger structural issue. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like it's a little bit weird because these projects are like so high stake, moving the needle on something without everyone knowing that there's something at risk, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Okay. So uh, with vulnerability disclosure and stuff, it's I guess one thing I wonder about a lot with security is having worked at companies and sort of been the person saying, hey, we need better security for this, we need to focus on this, and getting pushback, um, it, it does seem that like you can spend indefinite amounts of money and time on security. Also, you never see the benefit, you only see when it goes bad and when it breaks. So it's very, it's like, yeah, everything's secure, everything's working fine, and like, oh, now it wasn't. Um, so, so that it, it's hard to have a good feedback loop because of this. And so I do think that we're, it's quite likely we're, focusing too much on some things and not enough on others. Like some things are like, okay, this is super secure and it's like complete overkill and just, you know, spending enormous amounts of resources on something that's not going to happen versus, you know, leaving something completely open because no one was focused on that. So if you get like, do you guys have any examples where you think, you know, this is overkill and we don't really need to focus on it anymore. Like it's, you know, it, it is a security problem, but that's not where the attacks actually happen. Because I know for like, I'm thinking for me, uh, losing passwords seems to be more, like from people I've talked to, losing passwords seems much, much more common than some hacker getting into your computer and like grab, grabbing your private key and like brute forcing it. Uh, at least at least in people I know. Yeah, so. I mean, to put it kind of as a joke, like your biggest adversary is sitting in this very room, like it's you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're the, like the most likely person to lose your own funds. Yeah, so I mean, so yeah, do you think that you know, the sort of balance between usability and security, and also what, what things do people think is like overkill and is not being looked at instead? Do people have examples of those? Or, yeah. Uh, in most cases, uh, engineers uh, and people uh, often think that uh, the security solution is overkill, and, and the history is full of examples uh, where that was not overkill at all, because when the stakes are high, the attackers uh, have a high potential and they break systems. So. I, I, I mean, it, it's uh, very rare that the security is overkill. Very. Okay. So you say that, that even, uh, like you know, splitting things and like so. But have you seen examples where people, you know, over secure something and then lose access to it? Or I mean, you know. So I think uh, one example that's interesting to bring up here um, is the way that the Lightning Network is being deployed right now. Um, maybe. <laughs> um, so. One of the things that I believe is that like security is like a uh, you know preventative measure for when you're going to do something that's dangerous, rather than like when you're going to do something safe. Um, and I think that we want to do these like dangerous things. So it's like everybody loves rock climbing, um, but we also really love like belaying and like harnesses and ropes because when you like mess up your rock climbing, well, you don't like 
fall and die unless I you're mean, like that. Free one climbing guy. is a thing. Yeah, yeah free climbing is a thing. <laughs> but like, you know, they also practiced at one point in their lives with ropes. Um, so I think that it, it's important that we go like, okay, well, like, what are the things that like we really want to do? Um, this is actually one of the reasons why you know I really like the way that Ethereum rolled out their things. As I said, okay, well, people just want to write these contracts. Okay, like let's let them do it. Everybody else said, like, oh, geez, we don't, like, don't actually know how to do these things safely. Like, scalable, uh, scalability problems are going to be huge. But people need to like, experiment and do things. I think the problem is when you start doing something, it's all of a sudden really, really cool, and everybody else wants to start doing it. And especially in this space, that means, oh, and now I'm going to throw a like, million dollars into doing this, or a you know, hundred million dollars, <laughs> or now a you know, billion dollars. And it just like, balloons really, really quickly. This is what I was going to say about Lightning, is that the way that... Um, it's being rolled out right now is it was first on t a testnet and with even a limited value on the number of testnet coins and now it's on the Bitcoin mainnet but it's only up to $1,000 of value. And you yeah. can change that if you want but by default it's, like, it's, I mean, it's limited so that you're going to be safe. And over time we can kind of ease those security requirements up because we know that it's going to be safer to do in the like you know, main case. Yeah, but a lot of it's just imaging in that like, you know, the code, anyone can grab the code and just run it on mainnet and it's just like, okay, now we sort of say you can and I get maybe 10 emails a day. Like, when is Lightning Network going to be released? It's like, well, the code's been yeah. around for a year. Whenever like, you, you want. want. <laughs> yeah, you can use it, compile it, um, but we're not going to like advertise it as, hey, go for it. Um, so I don't, yeah, do you have any examples of sort of when overkill can backfire or when yeah, things... I don't know. I'm more on the same side as Charles. So in, in our company, Commonwealth Crypto, I think most of us are security geeks, and I think most of our conversations are like, uh, we're probably leaning on the, like, let's secure it more, let's secure it more, how much more, let's sandbox this part, how do we make sure the secret keys are sandboxed, well, do we trust the sandbox that's part of the Electron app, maybe we don't, let's audit that and make sure it's actually secure enough for us. So, you know, that's, that's kind of, because all of us essentially come from security background, everyone that we work with in our company. So I think we're on the, on the side of the extreme. I think um, on the security extreme, um, I do think the, the Ethereum case is super interesting. I have done a little bit of research on Ethereum. I've only looked at the peer-to-peer -peer network. I don't really understand the rest of Ethereum as well as I understand Bitcoin. But um, Ethereum is, to me, extremely fancy, fascinating because it's like a move fast and break things kind of project. And so... It's, it's just like incredible the things that are in there, that like the level of sophistication in the Ethereum technology that just like gets built out and is used. And it's now like the second most important blockchain. Like there's so much sophistication in there um, and so much like advanced technology. It really, it's, it's like stunning. So that, that is, um, you know, that is more on the side of like, yeah, let's try it and see what we can do and see how it works. And, eventually we'll figure out how to like lock down the system. And if you talk to Ethereum people, they'll say it's like still an experimental system, right? But, yeah. but at the same time, we're in this insane moment in time where you know, there's so much interest and so much excitement. We have startups building on top of Ethereum. We have dApps being built on top of Ethereum and just everything is happening so fast, even though while well, we don't really understand like necessarily exactly how the infrastructure should work. So it, I think we're at a very, very interesting point in time and that's kind of why some of these things are happening. Yeah. I think almost one of the Hayekian questions around this is like whether people can like build secure systems intentionally or whether people build lots of systems and then like one of them ends up being secure. I mean, there's definitely a lot of intention that like goes into like, um, you know, everyone's work on like, yeah, we're all aware that we should be secure, but everybody, you know, has the propensity to, you know, make a feature that they don't themselves understand. Um, uh, and, you know, be broken. And it's only through like having people competing that you kind of get you know, yeah. something that we don't know how to break. Survival of the fittest. I, I, I think, from my experience also, having overly secure, it's sort of a usability trade-off where, uh, you know, I know a lot of people at, who work in places where they don't really, can't use the internet, and or the, you know, corporate email is so locked down that they like, well, they bring their cell phone, they tether, and they use Gmail, right? And, and you know, people get around things. Or so the example in, in Bitcoin or blockchain kind of things would be, well, I can't, I don't want to run a full node. Right? There, there's, it's overly secure. It's like 180 gigs. It's got all these annoying things. So I'm just going to use Coinbase. Uh, you know, I'm just going to use a website where, yeah, maybe I don't have as much security, but I've got that usability. And so I'm making these. And so, so there are some kinds of compromises where, okay, can we have SPV in the middle and things like that. Um, yeah, this is actually becoming a more active focus, I think, among some people working on Bitcoin Core, is how can we get more people to be using things from the core implementation yeah, of yeah. things? Because hey, all of the code base is, let's say, the best code base for Bitcoin. Um, 
but you don't need to use all of it to benefit from the parts that are more secure. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, but, and then also, you know, users not recognizing security or not care, you know, a lot of people I've talked to don't care. And they're like, well, I think it's more secure for Coinbase to hold my coins. And in some cases that may be true. Um, do you think that like user education is, is, you know, it's obviously important, but like, what do you guys think about how to sort of train people and to sort of, you know, is it, no, it should be easy to use, it should be intuitive, or yeah, we need to really get people to up to speed on how these things work in order for there to be real security. So like, what role do you see sort of education having? Do you guys have? Uh, I mean, the security of a wall system, uh, this is a, the security is a, is a chain. Uh, the security of the, the wall system is, is the security of the weakest link of the chain. And often the weakest li link in the chain is the user because the user does not know exactly the stake, does not know what are the good practice and so on. So I think for the, in most cases, people who lost the, the coins, that was often because they did not understand how to use them securely, what were the, the good practice and so on. Um, at the very, very beginning of cryptocurrency, people uh, did understand very well what was the algorithm behind, what was the cryptography, what are the stakes and so on. But today we have, uh, we have uh, millions of users and most of, most of people does not understand the stake, does not understand anything. So that, that, that's why education is uh, very important and uh, I think at Ledger this is uh, one of our, our mission. Um, educate people to understand well what, what are the stake, where are the security, what, what are the good practices, and, um, and, and give them the opportunity to use crypto, crypto assets easily and securely. You guys have any ideas on user? Well, so I think one of the fundamental challenges in this space is that security is kind of like a monotonically decreasing function of time. Um, so like, let's say like I make a, a private key and then like I hide it under my rug. Like that second, it's probably fine because nobody's looked under my rug yet. But Absolutely. then like I go out and then I come back and like probably no one's looked under my rug. But then like I go out again and like now maybe somebody's looked under my rug. Um, so... I think that this is like when a new user comes in, they're like the least educated and then they're the most prone to making like bad decisions um, and then that can like permanently affect their security um, and privacy. So one thing for Bitcoin, for example, is like let's say you get your initial coins from Coinbase and you put them in your Bitcoin core wallet and then you like later are like, oh, actually I got to be private and then you like send more coins to your Bitcoin core wallet. Well, they'll now get like intermingled with those Coinbase coins and you'll be, you know, de-anonymized. Uh, and so I think it's just a general like thing that's difficult is like getting people to not do the wrong thing from like day one is going to be like a, a large challenge um, in general. I don't I don't know uh, if there's any way to tell people like you know hey don't try the difficult thing until you've you know you know use the training wheels until you're ready. Uh, people want to you know do it do it live. Yeah, I just want to say, I think that as this technology becomes more popular and, and people who are not technologists start to use it and start to rely on it, we're going to have to find ways for non-technologists to protect themselves. I don't think we know what those ways are. I think one of the nicest ways is actually what Ledger is doing, what the hardware wallets are doing. There's also some really nice, and the other hardware wallets, and there's also some really nice um, custodial solutions. So like something like a Coinbase um, those custodial solutions are going to have to continue existing. It's, it's just not going to be possible for people to uh, hold coins unless there's a custodian that they can trust. And I think in the industry right now, there's a huge focus on developing you know, technologies that the average user can use. Um, and so I think there's going to be a spectrum of users. There's going to be the users that want to have a hardware wallet. They're going to be the users who don't even know why they would ever want a hardware wallet and they just want to buy some coins and have them be safe the same way that um, you know, I would open a bank account somewhere. So I think we're going to see a spectrum of solutions and there's kind of only so much that education can do. I think that we need to design the systems to kind of like be fail safe in the face of users that don't care about the things that we as technologists care about. And that's going to that's gonna change over the next years. Um, and the other thing is that I think, like again, we're in the early stages of a lot of this. So, f you know, what we're building at Commonwealth Crypto is a way of doing trading on cryptocurrency exchanges without depositing your coins at the exchange. And there's a lot of interesting activity in this space of like trading on an exchange without having to trust the exchange with your coins. I think this is just like one example of how early we are on the curve of usability for 
the average user. Like the average, um, you know, we want to, we kind of want to be in a world where the average user doesn't have to really think about who's holding their coins at any given time. They should just somehow feel that these are safe and secure. So I think the whole structure of how people interact with coins is going to change a lot in the next few years in order to make the least, the less techie users be able to use it. And we can see like, you know, I have non-techie family members who were, who were talking about Bitcoin. So, you know, it's, it's re at least in December. So it's, 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 you know, it's, it's out there and it's going to hopefully continue to, to be out there and we need to, as technologists, think of ways to make it usable for, for the general public, not just for us. Yeah, I think because that, that is also a risk. Like maybe we don't and maybe it doesn't take off. You know, PGP, for example. Uh, there's, you know, countless papers. Why Johnny can't encrypt? Why he still, why he still? And, and I know with the MIT, I think Ron Rivas does a class where like everyone sort of tries out PGP. And so on the MIT key servers, there are like 40 or 50 keys that say that they're Ron Rivas because one of the students just like thinks he's signing someone else's key and actually makes his own key claim to be Ron's and then uploads it. Yeah, and when we did the MIT Bitcoin project, we had people like able to encrypt their address when they send it to us and sign it with their key if they have one. Um, and we got a large number of people who like submitted their key, like claiming to be the project. And like we like asked them, like, "Hey, what are you doing?" Like, "Oh, I just thought that this was the right thing to do." Yeah. Or or they mail you their private keys or yeah. the you know like so so PGP is a sort of you know classic example of like no one can figure this thing out. Like even after using it for years, I'm still not quite sure how it all works. Um, and you know if if a lot of these cryptocurrencies, a lot of these systems end up like PGP. You don't get a lot of usage, and then you end up with, you know, Google, and you end up with Gmail and things like that, and so then Coinbase becomes the whole system, and that's that's kind of disappointing. So it's definitely something we have to, you know, work on. Um, so how about do you guys have any other things you want to cover, and then we can do questions for the last uh, 13 minutes? Any other good? Okay, good. So we can go to questions. I guess there's microphones like there, both sides, both sides. and. Or if you are loud enough, you can just yell from your seat. It's not that big of a room, right? Okay. Are you going to do the yell option? Yeah. yeah. The, uh, <laughs> um, so I just want to comment. I think it's a shame with the social engineering that goes on on Twitter, how many people say, oh, send this you know, address to certain IEs. Yeah, that's new. <laughs> So, so I think from the like Twitter scam per, um, perspective, I think that like the people getting scammed the most are like the community. I personally don't think it's a big deal. I think that I don't have any evidence to back this, but my guess is that it's like the scammers themselves seeding the accounts so that they look more legitimate when people look and say like, oh, well, this account has actually done something. Um, so I don't know. I think we need like. I, a kind of you know more like social scientist person to go and try and like track down people who actually gave to these scams There's and what they were of, thinking. Uh, at, at Financial Crypto, I was taking sharing a taxi. Uh, I don't know if he's here. And someone said, "Oh, I love IOTA," and I was like, "Oh shoot, like this is awkward." Uh, <laughs> and, and then he said, "Yeah, they have really interesting botnets. Like I've been looking into the different ways they have all these Twitter bots and things like." I'm like, "Oh, okay, okay, we're we're, we're cool." Uh, <laughs> but so so having you know like social engineering and things like that, it's something people aren't used to. And I've talked to people who are not super technical and they have no idea that bots are even a thing. They just assume everyone, you know, they're like, wait, so there's computer program? Like, it's, what do you mean it's not a person? I'm like, no, that's not a, can you tell? Like, these are bots. And a lot of people out there just have no idea this is, is even possible, so. Yeah, but if, if you think about like email spam, you know, think about email 15 years ago, you would get all this junk in your email and it wouldn't end up in your spam folder and now it does. So I think it, part of this is like a symptom of things being early. This is also like one of those spaces where if you do have something like a Coinbase and they do provide this service of like being like, hey, don't send to this address, it's a scam, right? They flag things as spam, that would make them a really valuable tool for people to use and then you might see migration to like that particular custodial service. I don't think that that feature exists in any of the custodians right now, but I wouldn't be surprised if people started doing that as a way of differentiating. Um, 
And your second thing about re regulation, should it come from within the community or without the community? I think definitely from within the community. I think we should be the one to regulate this type of thinking because um, we understand, you know, we're the technologists, right? The technologists should be the one coming up with these, uh, these standards. And I think that that's been the case for disclosure generally, right? So like MITRE is staffed by technologists. Um, so I, I don't think we should wait for governments to come in and do that. I think it, the community should lead on that front. Okay, so uh, first off, thanks for coming to talk to all of us. Very interesting talk, um, you know, very important topic. Um, so one thing that I um, didn't hear discussed as much as I expected to was personal information on smart contracts. How do we secure that? How do we make that safe for data that's very sensitive when it's all running on a public blockchain? So I would love to hear a little more thoughts about that. I think we're all probably going to say the same thing, but anyway, <laughs> why, why do you have personal information on the blockchain? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe it's unclear that like anyone actually believes that's going to be something that's happening anytime soon. I think like the most likely candidates for things like that are like you're able to do an interaction between like known participants that's like enforced by some way. So an example of that is like zero knowledge contingent payments where you make a payment conditional on revealing some information to someone, but that information never touches the chain. Um, just the encryption key is on the, is on the chain. I think that that's probably, if anything, what would be the case is that like the encryption keys for some piece of data are on the chain and revealed, but the parties that actually have that piece of data are uh, like not publishing that information. Uh, I don't think there's any way to like store information permanently in a secure way uh, that I would be comfortable with. Yeah, so we've actually worked on this problem at BU a couple years ago um, with this paper called Tumblebit that's now actually built and deployed on in some places. So, you know, with, with something like Ethereum, if you just like put your name on an Ethereum smart contract just like that, like there's not much you can do. But I think there is a lot of really interesting research in the community, and it's really research right now. Some of it's sort of coming to deployment, but ways of mixing coins. So we have like Tumblebit, CoinJoin, all these different ideas from the Bitcoin world. We have Zcash, which allows you to have these anonymous transactions. So there's some effort on just like anonymous payments. I don't know about privacy for smart contracts that involve personal information. I personally haven't seen too much about that, but I also think that these are really interesting research problems, so I wouldn't be surprised that we would start to see things in the future. I think today we don't really have great solutions, though. Thank you. Okay, we'll do round robin. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so one of the things we briefly touched on was uh, standards, standardization for security, things like threat modeling. Uh, and one of the things that I think needs to be standardized, and we barely touched upon it, is a standard threat model for a decentralized application or a standardized uh, threat model for a crypto coin or things like that. Um, and I was wondering if you guys had any other comments or clarifications on this, because it is something that we as developers, uh, and also I'm in the security community as well, uh, need to have for everyone to say, here's what we're protecting against, and here are some answers to questions that people might have about how to protect it. So I think one of the difficulties in getting to standards is that people just like don't agree on who their adversaries are and what things they care to guard against. Um, so you see this by people who take like relaxed security models like SPV. Um, this is certainly a problem in like Bitcoin Core. Um, whenever we're trying to say like, okay, well, you know, like is this uh, network solution going to be good enough? Is there's a disagreement maybe about like who you're allowed to trust uh, and like what sorts of backups you want to retain, what you need to validate. Um, an example of this that I think is like fairly nuanced is Bitcoin Core has a feature called Assume Valid. And in assume valid, you have a uh, known hash where it is basically signed by uh, a lot of developers that say the signatures before this time um, are all valid. And if you have that, then catching up to the most recent chain is actually fairly quick. Um, but you still download the signatures, you can still check them um, you know, if you want to, um, but the default assumption is that they're valid. And this is, you know, conceivably falls within the threat model for uh, 
most users because if you're downloading a new piece of software with the new hash uh, anyways, like you're trusting that nobody was putting in bad code in there in the first place. And so it kind of works without a reduction of the security model. But there's no way to standardize that because in Bitcoin, like a lot of people don't want to assume valid. They want to validate the whole thing and that has to stay an option. So it's kind of, uh, the, the threat model is something that I think people always want to improve on. So as soon as you've like defined this is the threat model that we're operating under, you're going to have a set of people who say, I don't like this assumption, how do we get around that? Um, I think in terms of the business community, uh, that's a separate question. I think that that's like, you know, people just need to come together at least in some sort of economic majority and say this is what we're all going to assume is okay you know, to invest in, to participate on, or hey, are you expecting these things? Yeah, I'm expecting those things too. We can work together. Yeah. There's definitely probably as many threat models as there are coins out there. Like, you know, people don't work together on, <laughs> on these things. Like, they're all, you know, arguing and stuff. So it's going to be hard to get any cross-currency standard for these. Can I, can I say something about that? So I've worked with the Internet Engineering Task Force, the ITF, for a while, for like several years. And we don't have something like this for blockchain. Um, but in the ITF, for example, with routing security, there's a you know, there's documents, like there's an RFC that is a threat model for routing security and it lists all the threats. And it goes through like multiple years of discussion on mailing lists and blah, 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 and at the end we get to a standard. And we, we don't have this in the blockchain world. Um, what we do have is, for example, like theoretical cryptographers doing research and writing papers on what the right threat model is. I think it would be really wonderful if we could get there as a community, somehow go from it's hard to read what um, researchers are writing. It's hard for developers to read the papers that researchers are writing for threat models for something as sophisticated as a blockchain. So um, I don't know how we get there, but maybe we need to get to a place where um, researchers are contributing to these type of standards and we have some sort of like body that says this is... This is the different, this is the threat model. Maybe this is the high threat model and the low threat model and the medium threat model and maybe we don't agree, but at least we kind of know what the different gradations are and we have some documents that say this, but we don't have anything like that right now. Um, it would be nice if we did. To add into that, um, I would also like to see if there's anything that comes out of this. Maybe we can set up a mailing list where discussions like this can continue um, because it is very important for cryptography and cryptocurrency both. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Okay, next. Yeah, so um, one of the things that you guys mentioned was a huge source of security leaks was um, usability of the current interface. Like, for example, um, the current addressing system is like a 30, 30 character string that you have to copy and paste to send addresses. And for new users who are trying to use that system in the first place, it's very nerve wracking because if you mistype a character or you copy and paste it wrong, poof, there goes all your money. So I was just wondering what are some of the user, interfa user <laughs> interface benefits that you guys think that could be implemented that would solve a lot of these like new user problems. I think this is actually a wonderful candidate for kind of the security standards practices that we were talking about earlier. Uh, in Bitcoin, a lot of care is taken, such that like if you mess up your address in various ways, it's not going to be like a big problem. Um, specifically, there's a new standard called, uh, well, it's somewhat unpronounceable. Uh, it's 32. Uh, uh, thir you know, let's say it's Betch 32. Um, and that has error correcting codes in it and checksum. So if you mess it up, like, it's probably not going to be checked. Uh, like any software would reject that address by saying you probably mistyped something. In Ethereum, um, as far as I understand, you know, one of the Ethereum developers can correct me if I'm wrong, there aren't such safeguards. There's a, there's a capitalization thing. Okay. The it's, there is a standard, but it's like not quite as well supported. I think it, it breaks if you make like two mistakes, right? Or yeah, you've, you have fewer bits, and also it's not as widely supported because it was put in after the fact. Yeah. So um, it's better than nothing, but yeah. It's not great, but that's something that, that's just like not even consensus layer, just as you say, a usability feature. And that's definitely something that you could standardize of like, oh, how do we think users are going to mess up where they're trying to send things? And that could be applied across the entire industry. Um, but I haven't seen anyone who's like really pushing for like all exchanges to adopt, you know, like standard, you know, deposit withdrawal checksums and address formats and yeah. kind of force the industry Another, in that way. Like standards people in hardware wallets, like having the different phrases. Right, so that, there are different standards there. I've seen people arguing about like different languages, different phrases, things like that. Uh, have you, do you guys support, like, have you in, participated in that at all? I know people were arguing about like language. Sorry. Like uh, the seed, seed phrases and how 
a lot of it defaults to English, but then people in other countries would want different languages um, supporting that versus not. Uh, for, for now, you, we only support in, in English uh, for saving your seed, but uh, you're right, it's possible to, to save it in, uh, in, in other language. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely something that you know people are looking at, and I agree that like yeah, user interface is now still pretty crummy in a lot of these things, but gotta get people on it. Okay, so are we? Thank you. One more question? Are we? Out? We do one more question. Okay, yeah. Where do you guys see um, the future of security in terms of quantum computing and blockchains? <laughs> quantum computers. How do we secure uh, blockchains against quantum? Quantum computing. If, if ever they, they, they come out, uh, it's finished. <laughs> uh, well, so as long as you don't reuse your addresses, they're hashed, so you're going to be like relatively safe. Um, and then hopefully people come up with a solution to go from like the like knowing the pre-image of your address hash to, to sign like it. signing so, so something without with, revealing. You can do that with Taproot. So I, I yeah. have this whole. I was sort of joking. So Taj is going to save you. That's the. Uh, you can. <laughs> You could do it. I was sort of joking, but like I kind of want to put it in my wallet and be like, "Hey, this is quantum secure." It's kind of silly, but yeah, like a, a lot of there's a lot of discussion about that at groups, but it's all sort of like a lot of the developers are like, "Oh, we don't want to have to deal with this because like it's so far in the future." Um, but at the same time, it's like, well, maybe we should code some kind of you know Lamport looking signature and allow people and, to use it. And there are real trade offs though to like look at. So one is like in confidential transactions. Um, I can never keep it straight of which way it defaults, but like it defaults this, to quantum reveals amounts, but does not allow breaking of yeah of amounts. I so yeah. in for confidential transactions, you could lose all your privacy, um, but like the values would remain safe. Or you can do it such that like the uh, Values are remain hidden, but they're trivial to like forge whatever value you want, um, and that's just like a choice that the community has to make. And probably the right choice is to do the thing that doesn't like break the whole system. Most people would give up privacy for correctness um, yep. rather than you know vice versa. But yeah, quantum computers are like scary, but like hopefully not real enough right now that we've got to lose any sleep it, or development it, pace. It makes things lots less, lot less let me, fun. Let me just, actually this leads to a really interesting open question. So going back to my ITF background, in the ITF there's this concept called algorithm agility, which is basically if a crypto algorithm gets broken, my protocol should still work. I should have an upgrade path from like the whatever algorithm that I'm using now to the new algorithm. I don't know that we've thought about algorithm agility in the blockchain community as much, so it's a really interesting problem to think of, like how do you design your blockchain to be, to have have algorithm agility built in, and if that's like something that interests you, just look up that phrase. There's like all, all kinds of work on that from other fields that people have thought about. Cool. All right, a big thank you to our speakers. Thank you.